Now, leaving South Georgia, now we're going to go down into the Weddell Sea. We're going to go down to Halley and look at Halley. First of all, you get uh, light ice flows. These are only three feet thick. And the further south you go, the ice flows get thicker. These are probably eight to ten feet thick and not very easy for the ship to go through. And then the ice gets so heavy that it's difficult for the ship to go through. It has to uh, back off and charge the ice and break the ice flows. So going is very slow. There are very few leads of water between <coughs> this pack ice. There are lots of icebergs like this one. Now this is an old iceberg because it's been weathered. And you can see it's also tipped up. But in addition to these angular icebergs, there are what we call tabular icebergs. They're almost dead flat on top. These are 150 feet high, standing out of the water. And you must remember that this here is only one-eighth of the total thickness of the iceberg. You can land an aeroplane on there. It's so easy. Now, we've been studying a lot of these icebergs. You can see that they have layers in them. They are stratified. And we have found out that by taking a core through one of these icebergs and melting it bit by bit by bit, that we can collect dust that comes out of the atmosphere. These are micrometeorites, little tiny things, um, oh, smaller than little grains of sand, but they're all perfectly spherical because they've come filtering down through the air. And you can record here all the, the times when the meteorite showers take place. So that's another very interesting thing, but we have never found in any of these icebergs any organic material any carbon materials. Now, to put a base on uh, an ice sheet, like the Antarctic ice sheet, is not easy. To put a house down, a hut down, because these cliffs are 100 to 150 feet high. So what you have to do is find a place where there is a bay that's got sea ice in it, and bring the ship in alongside the sea ice. And then you can load, offload and take your materials inland to <coughs> build the base. Now we did find one very interesting creek, and we were able to bring the ship right in alongside here. And yeah, you see the, the way this is done, is to have uh, tractors like these. These are snow cats. And they pull uh, sledges like this. These are cargo sledges. And they pull them way inland. Now, because this ice sheet is moving all the time, bits keep breaking off the edge. So if you're going to build a hut there, you've got to build it way inland. Uh, otherwise, it, it might just break off and go out to sea. So usually we would build a hut about uh, 10 kilometers inland. And here, <coughs> after having been built several years ago, is Halley Station. Now you're looking at this picture and saying, but it's all flat. Where, where are the buildings? Well, all the buildings are underneath the snow because here about 10 feet of snow accumulates every year. <clears throat> so after 10 years, 100 feet would have accumulated and the weight of 100 feet of snow turning into ice would squash any of these buildings underneath. You can see all the aerial masts and there is an entrance to uh, the buildings underneath. You see the 
the personnel go down that one and the cargo goes down that one. You see, it's got pulleys and ropes on it. But the base is right down there. Now, these bases last probably only about eight years before they get squashed. <coughs> and at this very minute, they, the British Antarctic Survey is about to build the, the fifth hut at Halley. Somebody was talking to me about it just the other day. Now, somebody came up with a very bright idea to prevent the huts getting squashed. And that was to build cylinders, like here, and put the huts inside the cylinders, because a, a cylinder doesn't get squashed as easily as an angular hut. Now, this is all very well, but of course they also get buried. And then eventually the exits are too high, you have to have ladders inside and people fall down the ladders. And, and of course one of the most dangerous things uh, in any hut that has been buried like this is fire. If there's a fire down below, underneath the ice, you can't put it out because there you haven't got water down there. So all of these huts are very, they have a, a, a chemical powder that would uh, dampen the fire down and put it out. Now the Russians lost 37 people in a fire like that underground. Terrible, when you come to think of it. Now I must tell you about the emperor penguins because Near Halley is one of the largest emperor penguin rookeries. Now these emperor penguins are big, they're that high, but very tame because they've got no predators and they are stupid. Because they don't lay their eggs in the springtime like normal birds, they lay them in the middle of winter when it's coldest when the temperature here is minus 55 degrees Celsius. And that, that, that's getting a bit cold. You see, if you breathe out like that, your breath actually freezes and falls to the ground and goes tinkle, 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 tinkle. Now, it's as cold as that. Now, uh, what in, uh, we, uh, way back in, sorry, Way back in 1958, we discovered the second, 1948, sorry, we discovered the second known emperor penguin rookery, and we in fact studied these birds. We did an embryological study, and that is to uh, study all the embryos from the time the egg was laid right through uh, two months until the chick hatched. And we found out lots of very interesting things. We first of all put numbers on all the birds. One, two, three, four. We didn't know whether they were males or females. And then as every egg was laid, we put the number on and the date and the time. So we were then able to get a complete sequence of uh, eggs. They're quite big eggs, they're that big. They make good scrambled eggs, too. They're big. And uh, so a friend of mine uh, worked all this up, and he came to the conclusion that the emperor penguin is the most primitive bird on this earth. And the embryology is similar to that of the dinosaurs. Now, what happens is this, that the female emperor penguins lay their eggs and once they've laid their eggs they hand them over to any male bird that's standing by and he puts the egg on his feet and covers it up with his little flap of skin and he walks about like this now incubating the egg now you imagine with a, having a football on your feet and having to walk on your heels for two months, you get a bit tired, don't you? 
And so eventually the egg falls off onto the snow at minus 55. And if it stayed there very long, it would freeze. And so the embryo would get, uh, would get frozen. So any bird, <coughs> male bird, would now pick up the egg, put it on its feet, and incubate it. And this keeps happening. And you know, we found out that some of these eggs <coughs> had been incubated by as many as 28 male birds. Now you're thinking, where are the females? Why aren't the females incubating the eggs? The females have all gone off to sea to feed. You see. So uh, you can imagine uh, having one of these eggs incubated by 28 male birds. Now when the chick hatches, you know, it has one mother and 28 fathers. Now that's a very strange situation, isn't it? Now when, when the female penguins, emperor penguins come back, they take over any chick, whether it's from their egg or somebody else's or somebody else's, put it on their feet and uh, then they keep it warm with a little flap of skin and they feed it by regurgitation. Do you know what regurgitation is? Because they've got food out at sea in their stomachs and they sort of vomit this up and they feed the chick in this way. And these are the little chicks, these little fluffy furry chicks. There are the, all the adults. You can see you see how many chicks there are here. But each of those females only lays one egg. So it, it was very, very exciting to be able to be involved in studying these penguins. After all, I only study rocks, which is a bit different. Now, coming out from Halley in the Weddell Sea, you often get very heavy pack ice like this. Now, we were stuck in this pack ice in the ship for 23 days. And we began to wonder, would we get out? But eventually, it started easing and leads started forming through the, the pack ice. And then eventually, one day within <coughs> 20 minutes, there was open water and we just sailed straight out and we went straight up the Weddell Sea to the South Orkney Islands. In our ice strengthened ship, not an icebreaker, ice strengthened ship, the Edward Bransfield, named after the person who discovered Antarctica.